In today's video, the new novel from literary superstar Emma Donoghue, Diana Evans, Orwell Prize long-listed novel A House for Alice, Guadalupe Nettles Booker international long-listed novel Stillborn, a nuanced tale of sexual power dynamics, a book with my favourite fruit on the cover, exploring the role of women in northern Cameroon, I finally read my wife's favourite book, the latest novel from Booker Prize winner Anne Enright, and an unheard of number of DNFs. Hi, my name's Scott. Welcome back to Gunpowder Fiction and Plot, a channel where we review books. And by we, I mean I. I am way too common to use the royal anything, even their we. And by books, I mean literary fiction, new release, global literature. Let's crack on with the books. And as always, I'm going to start with the DNFs. Well, this is awkward. Not a single DNF today. But I've got 10 real books to talk about because they're only imaginary if I don't finish them. And I've ranked them from worst to best. So let's begin with The Apology by Jimin Han. This is a book about a 105 year old South Korean woman who upon receiving a letter decides to take her sisters with her to America to stop a potential wedding. What then happens is we learn the history of this family, the American, the South and the North Korean branches of it. We learn the reasons why this old lady wants to stop this wedding so much and I can't for the life of me figure out why she couldn't have done it by writing a letter. Such an unnecessarily forced plot. And then halfway through this book, something idiotic happens. I'm waiting for the protagonist to wake up from the dream she's having, only I start to realize that that's not going to happen. This idiotic thing is actually the plot. The characters and writing in this novel are all right. I did like the cranky old lady protagonist with her petty grievances towards her sisters. The themes of family have definitely been done better, but they weren't bad. But this book just makes no sense. It reads like a half-talented author got a nine-year-old's made-up story and said, yes, I know, I'm going to turn that into adult fiction. Honestly, this is really really poor. It's illogical. It's idiotic. I really only recommend reading this book if you're drunk or you're suffering from a concussion. I kept reading this thinking it was absolutely stupid and there's no way things are going to end as they are. There, there had to be an explanation to this. <sighs> And look, I'm sure acid trips are a lot of fun, but they're not if you're the supervisor. Just avoid this one. A House for Alice by Diana Evans. The title of this book is a reference to the VS Nepal classic A House for Mr. Biswar. This book begins with two tragic events, the 2017 Grenfell Towers fire in London, which killed 72 people and destroyed 100 houses, and the death of Cornelius. Cornelius's wife Alice is a Nigerian immigrant. She is old, she is retired, and she has grown up children. And she wants to see out her days in Nigeria. I think the major theme of this book is about immigrants trying to find a sense of place or belonging, a, a home so to speak. Alice is Nigerian British, but the Britain that she has moved to has been transformed into a different Britain while she's been there, and the Nigeria that she's left hasn't remained static either. She has family in both countries. Alice's three daughters are torn over if she should stay or go, but Alice is sending money back home to Nigeria in order to have her house built. Unfortunately for Alice, it's Nigeria and things are complicated, bureaucratic. There are people that must be bribed and people who are trying to trick you out of your money. There's a lot of corruption, but also there's a lot of hope. This is the sort of story that I usually love, but ultimately a I think it's just a bit too weak. The characters don't come across vividly enough. The themes don't intersect well. And I really think Evans needed to do a lot more with the words she had. I didn't dislike this, but it's disappointing to see something with so much potential be quite an average book. Stripped to the Flesh by Otter Toda, translated by Emily Ballesteri. This is a short story manga collection, and this is my first ever manga. I've been wanting to try one out for a long time, but to be honest, I'm not really sure what the fuss is. This is just a graphic novels where you turn the pages backwards. Am I missing something? In this collection, each short story gets progressively shorter and I think progressively worse. However, I really loved the first short story about an influencer who is a trans man who hasn't begun transitioning 
auditioning and makes videos about cutting up game. I guess that's butcher tube content, which just sounds horrible. Anyway, he makes the choice to begin transitioning and we see the hate he gets from his fans. We also see his relationship between father and son, the pressure placed on this trans dude to find a husband and to be a wife by his father this is such a powerful story the father rather than being a hateful bigot is just really set in his ways and just doesn't understand and doesn't really listen and now he's sick and this trans man is questioning do i want my father to die without seeing the real me and if he does see the real me will he accept me should i just pretend until he's gone one other thing Things I really thought was done well was the expectation of gender roles in society and how trans identity really makes that look stupid. The father thinks that our protagonist is a tomboy who wants to go hunting with him when he's a child. And the father's like, no, no, how will you find a husband when you're grown up? What husband wants a wife who can hunt? Obviously the whole trans thing really makes a lot of what the father thinks look very stupid here. Such a powerful story. I was a little confused about the timelines of the transitioning and the timelines of the father's illness. I think that would have benefited from a bit more time spent on it and explaining a few more details and just immersing us a bit longer. But overall, I think that this was a great short story. I wouldn't bother about the rest of the stories in this collection, to be honest, which descend into two page or six to 12 frame flash stories by the end. And they were just really stupid, fun writing exercises, not really worth publishing. But I think if you think of all the other stories in this, as a bonus to the main story, and that's how it is titled, Strip to the Flesh is the Major Story, then I think that that will really set up your expectations best. Learn by Heart, Emma Donoghue. Set in a Yorkshire all-girls school in 1805, this is a romance between Eliza Rain, the child of a British man, and an Indian woman who were not married, and Anne Lister. These are two real-life people, and Lister, as they are better known in this book, is often labelled as the first modern lesbian on account of her being part of the first lesbian wedding in Britain. Lister is also often called Gentleman Jack. Told from the point of view of Eliza, this is a young lesbian coming-of-age story, a realisation of sexuality, and it also touches on issues around racism, inequality, money, legitimacy, and I mean legitimacy as in were your parents married when you were born or not. Donahue has done a lot of research and it's really fascinating to learn about the point of view of people at the time and the attitudes in society. I also really enjoyed the way lesbianism interacted with the other themes involving prejudice and inequality. I think it's a really lazy way of looking at homophobia to say that it's racism based on who you're attracted to rather than your skin colour. But Donahue is able to demonstrate the difference between racism and homophobia, not to mention all the other isms that is included in her novel. I also really like how Eliza wasn't aware that she was developing a crush on Lister. That made the romance so much better and easier to support because it was like not just a romance, but a realization of who you were and coming to terms with identity. However, I thought this book was just a little shallow. I'm not unhappy I read this book, but it really could have used with an injection of something. It was a little on the boring side. Maybe it needed to have a lot of the schoolgirl stuff trimmed or even removed. I just don't think I agree with Donahue's choice of what to make slow paced and what to make fast paced. This is one where I think if you've got yourself a copy, read it, it's enjoyable enough. But if you don't own a copy, don't be adding it to your shopping list. One for the Emma Donahue super fans and completionists. My Last Year of Innocence, Daisy. Albert Florin. Set in the backdrop of the Monica Lewinsky affair, Isabel is attending a wealthy college. Her father seems to be running the family business into the ground after Isabella's mother has recently passed away. Isabel has a sexual encounter with the only other Jewish student on campus, but she's not sure if it was consensual. She never said no, 
but she never really wanted anything to happen either. And I've read quite a few reviews of this book and this incident is really quite controversial with reviewers, but there's not a lot of agreement on why it is controversial. Some people are saying it's victim blaming and anti me too. Other people are saying that she wasn't raped and that she changed her mind afterwards. And I think this disagreement really demonstrates a need for a book like this. And I thought I'd discuss this point. The author is asking us to consider the situation. They're not passing judgment. It's up to the reader to determine if the situation is rape. The protagonist is unsure. The man in the situation doesn't think it's rape, but the friend she is talking to about it does. Nobody, however, is really listening to Isabel. After the incident, before the incident, or during the incident, nobody is listening to Isabel. And that, for me, should be enough to tell anybody if it's rape or not. But yes, Isabel does change her mind afterwards. She goes from undecided to no. But the situation is really there to be compared to what happens next. Isabel develops a crush on her formerly famous poet English professor. The cliche thing happens and of course this English professor is married with a child. Now this is an affair that Isabel actively pursues and consents to but this is obviously wrong. I think it's really interesting that it's told in conjunction with the Lewinsky affair. It's really very similar to the Monica Lewinsky affair but taken from the White House into a college environment. The point of this book is to have a nuanced discussion of the power dynamics within sexual relationships. You, the reader, can decide if Isabel was or was not raped. But this is a novel and it should be looked at in the light of the whole novel. The similarities and the differences between the various sexual encounters included in this book. And to limit this conversation to rape is to ignore the power dynamic in every sexual encounter in this novel. Women are always being used and exploited in some way, whether you think it is consensual or not. This book is far from perfect, but it is well written and I think it's a really fantastic conversation starter. Everything is beautiful and everything hurts. Josie Shapiro. Mickey is five foot tall, dyslexic, and the victim of bullying. Then one day Mickey discovers running, and she's good. She's really good. Told in two timelines, a modern day timeline where she's maybe 40 years old, and she is running the Auckland Marathon, and a past timeline that is constantly moving forward and catching up to modern day Mickey, but starting when she's about 16 years old. This is a book about fitting in and being yourself, about expectations, and the feeling of being worthless, it tackles one of the really big feminist issues. And I don't want to tell you which one it is because I think that could spoil things, but there's a big one in there. Mickey is such an easy to like character, but she really struggles with this feeling of worthlessness. She is from the wrong sides of the tracks. She's a woman. She's small. She's not academically gifted. She's poor. She doesn't have any friends. Her parents dictate her life. And a lot of this book is about her finding herself, finding a place that she is happy with. It's a book about depression, trauma, and healing. And I thought that was handled quite well, but there are a few little things about this book that annoyed me. A lot of this book is about running. And I know that this might shock people, but you're looking at the seventh fastest Victorian Southeast region under 14s cross country runner in whatever year I was old enough to qualify for that. And also the 30th something at state level of that year. My mother, is an Australian track gold medalist in the 4x100 metre relay team. She was on the same team as Jane Fleming. My parents met at athletics. My father is still running almost every day. And the point of all this is to say that I know a little bit about running. It's something that I used to do a lot. And there are a few little errors. Because Mickey is short, she says that she has to take two steps for every one. And that's just not how running works. If you're running at the same speed as somebody else, you have the same stride length. Otherwise, you're running like a fool and you're certainly not good enough to win a race. Also, if running is causing you knee problems, it's probably because you're running at the wrong cadence. And that kind of made it hard for me to get behind the eating disorder and the semi-professional running scene that Shapiro was painting. Because I can definitely see the pressure to lose weight and to be a certain weight, but also fueling your body correctly is so important for peak performance. And I found it difficult to trust that this was an 
accurate representation of the poor coaching that Mickey encountered. I thought it really took me out of the book. Just a little bit more research into this topic would have really elevated this. However, I think that these flaws are overshadowed by Mickey's character journey, which is clearly the more important aspect of the novel. The whole book is relatively simple, the plot, the prose, the themes. I think the character work was the best aspect of the writing. I think that this is just a good book. I don't think it's a great book. I think it's a good book. But it is nice to see a strong Kiwi novel out there. You don't see a lot of them making it out of New Zealand. The Impatient by Dajali Amu Amal, translated by Emma Ramadan. This is the first book for my Patreon book club and a big thank you to all of my wonderful Patreons who I'll mention at this point in my video. Now if they can now see how behind I am with these recent reads videos and I will endeavour to catch up. We've actually read another one, maybe even two books depending on how long it takes me to edit this video and upload it. Been the first month of uh, the book club we decided to read a short book because there was limited time and just, just dates. This is about three women living in the north of Cameroon who fight back and rebel against the repressive culture which includes domestic abuse and polygamy. It is really three interconnected novellas. You get the stories of Morella, of Hindu and of Safira all separately but they're all important to each other's story. I thought that this was an effective way of showing the different experiences that different women would experience within this culture. I don't think that you can ever show me one person of a culture and have that experience be indicative of everybody. Ramala loves a man, but her father agrees to a marriage proposal from an older, wealthier man against her wishes. Safira is the co-wife of this man, and she is jealous towards her new younger wife and disappointed in her husband who she loves dearly. Ramallah's younger sister Hindu is married off to a cousin who she hates and who she doesn't want to be married to and he is horrible to her and beats her. We see the way men control women in this culture, threatening to divorce their wives and potentially leave them homeless, beating them, punishing one woman for the actions of another, for the action of their children. What struck me as really terrible is how to Together the men were in this book, how they both controlled the property and hence their daughter's avenue to escape, and how they kept their daughters in abusive situations. They sided with men over their daughters, over uh, just... I also really liked the character arc of Safira, who was quite detestable early on. But when you get to see things from her point of view, her actions make much more sense and they really do humanise her. I thought this was a good book. It did what it says on the tin, but it didn't do a lot more. It's simple. It didn't take my breath away, but I thought it was a really worthwhile and interesting read. Stillborn by Guadalupe Nettle, translated by Rosalind Harvey. Before I review this... I want to say this book is advertised as for fans of Rachel Cusk and Sheila Hetty, and that's rubbish. This book has a plot. Yes, it's feminist. Yes, it's about emotions, but it is stylistically very different from those two authors. And I'm not sure if that's Bloomsbury doing it or if it's Fitzcarraldo, but please stop it. Also, if anybody from Fitzcarraldo is watching, please hire a cover artist. Salty opinions about plain blue covers aside, this is actually a really good book. I was really worried that the title was going to be a spoiler and it really wasn't. This is about two women who are career driven and in their mid 30s and they seem to have decided not to have children. But when Alina tells Laura that she's pregnant, Laura starts to get attached to a local child. Alina has pregnancy difficulties and is told that her fetus doesn't have a heartbeat. Alina is grieving the loss of her child and this creates this push-pull relationship between her and Laura, pulling them apart and pushing them together. Alina also has to deal with some pretty terrible medical advice and a real lack of responsibility that is taken by the doctors she sees. I think we've all had incidents with doctors where they haven't listened to us and they think they know better and you're pretty frustrated that you can't communicate with them. And this book has some pretty frightening examples around medical malpractice and childbirth. 
And I really approve of the way that Nettle was exploring that without challenging the science and the medical best practice, but challenging the reality of the situation. This is really at its heart, just a book about motherhood and about grief. And you can really see how nobody quite understands Alina or Laura and what their relationships with children mean to them and what motherhood means to them. Maybe it could have gone in a bit harder with the themes, but that's a minor criticism. This is a good book. The Book of Daniel by E.L. Doctorow. This is Nell's favourite ever book. And I did this as a buddy read with Sean. There is a video up of us discussing this on his channel. I will link it in the stuff for you. Well worth checking out. This is a retelling of the Rosenberg trial from the point of view of the Rosenberg's son. Daniel, written in 1971, and Dr. O is assuming that you are familiar with the Rosenberg trial. If you don't know, the Rosenbergs were put on trial and subsequently executed for being communists, committing treason, and passing on secrets to the Russians. That's not what they were put on trial for, but that's a pretty uncontroversial interpretation of what happened. Dr. O has changed some things. For example, the Rosenbergs had two children, both sons, and Dr. O has changed change the younger child to a girl. This is very well researched, so this change is quite intentional, and it's something that Dr. O is using to demonstrate the effects the trial and execution of his parents had on Daniel. This makes it very difficult to read. The way Daniel treats his sister and then his young wife is really disgusting, and it makes him quite a hard character to like. Dr. O jumps around in the timeline, showing you the child Daniel and then the adult Daniel, and it can be tough to empathise with Daniel, to empathise with this poor child who is about to see his parents die, and then it is so much harder to empathise with this really unpleasant and abusive adult who really needs quite a lot of therapy. But it is also such a powerful way of of demonstrating the effects such events have on children and how that affects the adult that they become. I think that that was really masterfully done and just tragically sad, but it really will test you as a reader. You have to be very forgiving of your characters. The other thing I think Dr. O has done brilliantly is his discussion of the political situation around this. He's really unbiased, but still warts and all in his retelling of this event. You can see how fixed the trial was, but you can also see who was guilty and who wasn't. And if you have opinions going into this book about the trial, then whatever they are, you're going to have your opinions on it challenged, not with arguments, but with facts told through the effect it had on the humans around them. This book is leading up to a devastating event. You know it's coming. I've not had many books that have had this sort of slow, creep where you're kind of reading this book you don't even know if you like it it's just a book that you're currently reading and you get to the end and you have this emotional gut punch that sad moment that the whole book was building towards and it just works it's devastating and you realize that this whole book was amazing everything fell into place. I think Sugi Bane by Douglas Stewart is the only other book I can think of that had that same boiling the frog approach to just how amazing it was with its sadness and horribleness. Dr. O is asking some really big and disturbing questions. Should the government be able to unfairly kill people for the greater good? Do you trust the government to pick who is good and who is bad? Is the government killing the Rosenbergs to further their control of the state? Or are they killing them because they're a threat to the state or they're a threat to the people? Regardless of what the truth is, the Rosenbergs didn't get a fair trial. Guilty or innocent, the result would have been the same. There's some huge questions around justice for that. I also thought there was a really good feminist interpretation to be had from this novel. The price women pay for the men in their lives. That the mother was tried in an attempt to get to the father. That they were tried as a couple when they had different levels of... Of involvement. Then there's also the themes of trauma and family and what happens to children and how that affects adults. There is the whole witch hunt of the communist things and McCarthyism. And I've not even mentioned that this family was Jewish and how a lot of this book had a almost Nazi Germany World War II feel to it of them being hunted and just 
treated completely unfairly. Dr. O's writing is sublime. His character work is fantastic. This is a really great book and I can see why it is Nell's favourite. The Wren, The Wren, Anne Enright. I've got to be honest, another Irish author writing another amazing book. I do feel a little bit threatened. If Ireland keeps producing good books, people are not going to bother watching BookTube for book recommendations. They're just going to buy books by Irish authors sight unseen and get really good books. So if you're watching this, please post Irish books that are really terrible in the comments section so that the next time I'm reviewing an Irish book, I can keep an air of mystery about the review because bloody hell, they're on a good run at the moment, aren't they Irish authors? In this novel, we alternate between Nell and Carmel. Nell is is the great granddaughter and Carmel the daughter of a famous poet who left his ill wife to focus on his writing career. These sections are interspersed with random bits of poetry written by him. This was a real bombastic mess of a novel and I loved every second of it. I think it's a real achievement to write something like this and to have it work. The way Enright has captured the complexity of the family dynamic is nothing short of genius. The mother-daughter relationship between Carmel and Nell is so so full of love, but not always trust. Things are hidden. There are points when you believe the characters actively dislike one another. Then we have this really complex relationship between Carmel and her father, and how there is still love there, despite the trauma that also so exists. It's also about generational trauma, depression. It's feminist. It's really funny in places. It's really dark and sad in other places. I have never read Anne Enright before. I knew she was famous. I knew she had won a Booker Prize a number of years back, but I was so convinced by her building of Nell that I decided to Google her to see if she was Nell's age, which is late 20s, because it sounded like she was writing from experience. But then I was so convinced by her building of Carmel as well, and then of Phil, the grandfather. It is a beautifully written novel. Nobody, even the people that don't like this book, will say anything other than stunning when they are describing the prose and the poetry she has written. It is about as experimental as I like to go which is not super experimental but the writing is so strong it really gets away with that and it's something that I really usually just hate and more than liking this book I legit like Anne Edright as a human being after reading this that question who would you invite to a dinner party Anne Edright she's clearly very intelligent she's hilarious emotionally fluent and slightly odd perfect for a dinner party guest I am very confident that large sections of this book went over my head but Nell's struggle with the men in her life her struggle with her mother her struggle finding a place her struggle with the trauma and then similar struggles with Carmel oh I mean it's it's just delicious. This is a relationship novel and an emotional pull. The ending is probably a little bit whatever, but it's one of those novels where the ending is not the point. Just a stunning book. That is all the books. If you've stuck around for this long, um, tell me your favourite dog breed in the comments. And if you could like and subscribe, that would really help the channel a lot. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.